Welcome back, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in today. It's my pleasure now to be joined by Pete Romnis, Cybersecurity Principal of the U.S. Public Sector CTO Office at Cisco. Pete, as always, it's a pleasure to catch up with you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, doing this with me, Billy. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, and I, I think we're, we'll explore a lot today on the topic of zero trust. And, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about zero trust, I think the place we have to start is with the recent uh, executive order, uh, President Biden's executive order. Uh, or, or zero trust was a large part of that. Um, so I'd love to start with, you know, the priorities that you see coming out of the administration currently around zero trust and cybersecurity writ large, and what kind of momentum you see being made uh, at the current moment. Um, so I see this uh, executive order as something being uh, enormously significant, um, mainly because it's a realization that that our data is significantly vulnerable. Um, and I, I think it kind of acknowledges that we've been defending our networks in a different way in the past where if, if you were able to get into our network, kind of the, the castle and moat approach, you could get to almost anything. Um, and this says that the agencies are supposed to use zero trust principles to limit uh, the capability of the bad guys to get to critical data in the first place, as well as if they do get into our environment, it limits how easily they can move around once they're in to get to other places. Um, so it limits the, um, the exposure that we have. Um, I love using a hotel analogy for this, whereas, you know, you don't get, when you go to a hotel, you don't get in the front door and then you can go to any room. Um, you go in in the front door and you pass a check. You get a, a key to your room and for the, your most valuable things, you would put it in a safe in the hotel closet. Um, and that's kind of the idea of what zero trust does. And I think that the EO is acknowledging uh, that for government. And it's also uh, allowing some momentum to grow within our agencies. Uh, that zero trust is an important way of looking at this and the importance of zero trust. So we're starting to see agencies pick up on this. Um, of course, different ones are in different parts uh, of their journey, um, but everybody's talking about it now. Certainly are. And I, I think uh, later in the conversation, I think we can get into that point you made about the exposure and the spread of events once. Uh, yes. The bad actors are in there, but let's let's while we're on this topic of of sort of policy and the executive order, there's a lot of policies out there um, that sort of predate this executive order that uh, I think will have some um, connectivity to it. Um, there's a lot about the cloud and other policies like Tick 3.0 um, that play into zero trust. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of that intermingling of of all these diff different policies that re relate to people's access around a network yes. and, and and especially in this era of the cloud. So th the short answer of all this is that zero trust enables all these other things. Um, uh, but I like to talk about how NIST has defined zero trust in their uh, special publication 800-207, where they talk about it as, um, organizations making risk-based policies and using them to control access to every enterprise resource, right? With a policy of enforce a policy enforcement point in front of every resource so that before access is granted, trust must be created. Um, and, and so it's, it's the idea of giving agencies the ability to set a policy and then to enforce a policy throughout their, their organization. Um, and the whole idea that trust must be earned before uh, access is granted. Um, 207 talks about uh, that as kind of the center of zero trust. And then they talk about all the security tools that go into making these trust decisions. So, uh, you know, when you start talking about CDM, um, you know, that's a big government program, continuous diagnostics and mitigation, and, and CDM provides you input to make these trust decisions. Or if something bad happens that you see with your CDM system, you can revoke that trust decision. Um, and then for like TIC 3.0, uh, TIC, TIC said that every uh, access to government, uh, from the government to the internet must come back to headquarters 
go through a security stack and then go out to the internet. Um, and that, of course, produced what was called the tic tacs, uh, <laughs> where you you have bad latency, bad user experience, expensive communications, all of that of going sometimes from one end of the country to headquarters and then back out to a cloud on the other end of the country. So traversing the country twice. Well, if you apply zero trust to that, what you're saying is you're putting your trust boundary uh, at the resource. And so that when it goes out to the internet, it is safe to do so. Um, and TIC 3.0 allows you to do that if you put the proper precautions in place. Um, and, and the same is true of, you know, if you have assets in the cloud, if you put a boundary around it and apply TIC uh, zero trust principles to it, then you can do that safely. So it really is, you know, zero trust is not a, something that you buy. It's not something that you do. It's a way of thinking. It's a, it's a, it's a design principle. And if you apply it to all these things, it enables them. That's a great point. Uh, let's move on to, you know, you mentioned the sort of once a, a, a bad actor gets through the boundaries and yeah. zero trust kind of limits their ability to move through. Um, and, and just using some recent examples, uh, there, there's been these attacks like solar winds and others on my, Microsoft Exchange and things like that. Um, yes, and I'm yes. curious, you know, and it, I think this is a, a big question to ask. It's a loaded question, but it's one <laughs> that people like to ask a lot. Um, you know, would zero trust, if zero trust was more uh, widely used within the government because some government agencies were impacted uh, in those breaches, uh, would it have affected uh, or mitigated that breach or the, the ability for those bad actors to spread throughout uh, those networks? Yeah, well, first off, I hate to second guess people who have been breached because defending is a hard job. Um, now, of course, some zero trust principles would come into play. So, um, for what, from what we know about solar winds, is that they attacked the company solar winds um, and were able to gain access uh, by, I, I'm assuming, by impersonating an employee. Um, and one of the things that, um, Zero Trust says is that you should use multi-factor authentication before yeah. you allow uh, employees to um, connect, and that may have been able to stop it. Um, um, of course, you know it's just another step that you can take. And then once in, if they did, if you were applying Zero Trust throughout the the environment, it may have stopped the spread into the development uh, organization and into the uh, update system for all their customers. From the other end um, of the SolarWinds thing to the customer side, um, if customers were using um, uh, micro segmentation, uh, you know, allowing access just to the individual resources like Zero Trust calls for, that may have also limited damage. Again, it's hard to second guess, and I hate to do that to anybody. But th you know, those are just a few examples, and I think zero trust principles pretty much help with almost any situation. Sure, sure. It's it's an unfair question to ask, but it, it yeah. it's, it's one that people ask a lot. Um, and I think that's the point of the EO and why it came out was to sort of make sure things like that don't don't happen anymore. Um, Pete, you, you've, we've we've talked before about your work with, and you mentioned NIST earlier on, uh, the yep. NIST National Cybersecurity. Uh, Center of Excellence um, the, on Zero Trust. Um, you've done some work with that team. Uh, so tell us about that and, and sort of what uh, is being accomplished there. Um, yeah, so, you know, being a part of Cisco, we're really proud to have been working with the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence for a long time. Um, we truly believe that the standards that NIST uh, demonstrates help move our economy forward. Um, and, you know, one of Cisco's big things is we want to give back to our communities. We want to make sure that we're, you know, we're trying to connect the whole world and this always helps. Um, Cisco has advanced technologies that contribute to zero trust. Um, and so by being involved with NIST as they are developing these documents, it allows us to tell them about them and, and things that they may not have realized. Um, you know, an example I love to give is that in order to do the segmentation of a network, it's conventionally been thought that firewalls were needed to, to you know, turn on and off ports to not allow, uh, you know, certain parts of the network to talk to another part. Um, well, you know, modern advanced switches that most of our customers already have a ton of 
can also be used for this. Um, and so in the NIST 200 uh, or 800-207, they actually acknowledge that it's not just firewalls, but it, it's advanced switches and routers and other ways can be used to control access. And you know, the modern switch can, can that you know we have all through our networks can control access to the individual port. So if one device is giving you problems, you can disconnect it or make them re-authenticate. You don't have to shut down a whole VLAN or however, uh, what other way that you uh, segmented your network. So, it, you know, it's things like that that we can bring to the table and that, that we hope that will be incorporated as NIST uh, puts out their documents. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Pete, let's close with a question uh, on, on, on sort of what's next and the, the sort of challenges that still exist um, and, and, and what those challenges are that remain on the journey to, or the federal government more specifically, is journey to yeah. zero trust. Well, it's, it's really, I think it's really a matter of getting the zero trust mindset and moving forward. And I think that's what this EO really does, you know, kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation. Um, it's an, and it doesn't have to be a matter of throwing away what you already have in your environment. It's about developing a plan um, and making strategic additions that, so that you can get the most out of what you already have with this zero trust mindset in mind. Um, things that I like to point out that are important for zero trust is this whole idea of trusted access, right? It's before you get to any asset and from from any asset that could be a person, it could be an IoT device, to any other asset that may be in your data center, it may be an app, it may be a micro app, you know, you name it. Those are assets to you. And you have to have this ability to control access to all of those, um, both going in and going out. Um, the other thing that I see as very important is this continuous visibility and enforcement. Knowing, knowing what's going in, and being able to control so that you can control this access and see what's going on in your environment. We talked about micro segmentation, but getting it down to the individual device, I think is important. And one thing that is always overlooked is automation. Mm -hmm. With zero trust, you're making tons of access decisions and it just can't be done using the old access control list or with somebody trying to monitor it and make it happen. It has to be automated. Um, and finally, uh, threat intelligence. You need to know what threats are in your environment, what threats are in the worldwide environment, because that affects your trust-based decisions. So, um, you know, I always talk about the road to zero trust doesn't have an endpoint. Um, and the good news is, is that most agencies already have everything they need to get started, like the switches and routers that I already talked about, and, and, and many other parts of, uh, of the network and your environment. Um, and of course, um, you know, our Cisco teams are there to help if anybody needs it. And, and we really want people to get from point A to point Z for zero trust is kind of where we're trying to get. That's great. That's great. It's all about the mindset. That's the takeaway from it. Um, Pete, always a pleasure to chat with you. Um, and it, it's, it's been great, uh, to, to hear about what, what you're doing with zero trust and the federal progress there. So, uh, we'll, we'll table it for now, but I uh, hope we can do it again soon. Thanks very much, Billy. It's great to see you. You too.